Well, that worked out because I got to have both teachings in the same teaching. Okay, and I, which worked out too because I didn't think I had enough of, of, of that one to do a whole hour with. So I got about 35, 40 minutes of it. So it worked out. All right, so if you have any comments or questions about the teaching, this is called the afterburn. All right, so you're welcome to come and line up over here. We got chairs, okay? If you're online, you can start typing in. Our Shamish team will take care of the comments and questions that you have there, and they'll, they'll read them over the mic when they get to that time. Please do not be offended if we don't ask every question that is typed online. We may miss a few or just skip a few for whatever reason. There's too many of you and only a few of us, and we only have, like, a limited amount of time here, okay? So, I was gonna look at the clock and say something as far as how much limited time, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna box myself in here, we're just gonna take as many as we can take. All right, we'll begin with Pete. So, Rabbi, this was uh, quite inspiring, and what occurred to me is, and this is uh, qu something I've been wanting to ask you about for a while, it seems throughout Exodus there are cycles that repeat themselves, that they go through the wilderness, they meet a challenge, um, there's, some, there, there's some deliverance from that in some form. For example, when they're hungry, they're provided manna. When they want meat, they got quail coming out of their nose. Right. Uh, when they're thirsty, rock coming. It's, it's one thing after another, but they keep going through these same cycles, which tells me leaving Egypt wasn't enough because as soon as they left Egypt, they were almost immediately confronted with a challenge, which... Yahweh provided for them and, and redeemed them or saved them, delivered them out of that challenge. But then there's another challenge and another challenge, which uh, I guess what I'm getting to, that's, that's true in our own lives. It's not enough for us to have our bubble popped. We have to be able to meet those challenges. And at the same time, it's worth remembering that only two out of that group that left Egypt actually went into the promised land. Well, of the men over, over 20. Yes. But, but a whole generation, the whole yeah. generation had to die, which, which tells me maybe everything about us that was us has to die in some form for us to make that transformation. Yes. Well, look, and what you're talking about is in the teaching baptism of fire, okay? Because baptism of fire is not charismatic. Don't let, you know, whatever you're thinking it is, it has to do with, it's a... It's a Yahweh system of quizzes and tests, exams, to see where you're at, okay? To see how much you've understood. So when they came out, part of it's like just saying, look, I asked you if you're ready, he's asking you, are you serious? Okay? Because you claim to be ready. So it's okay, let me see how serious you are. I'm gonna give you a test or a trial, and we'll see how you do with it. And then, by the way, there's several things that happen with the test and trial. First of all, you should see how far you've come and how far you're not there yet. And you should also see his intervention at the end of the trial, which should build and strengthen your belief and your trust and your faith, okay? And then you go forward some more, and then it'll test you again. Baptism of fire is that, okay? So you have baptism of water. What's baptism of water? Washing clean to have a fresh start, right? So they went out of Egypt, and they're all dirty, and they're all from the paganism and the slavery, and, and they go through the sea. They don't actually get wet because it's dry land, but the picture is they're going through the, the waters. And they come out on the other side now, they're clean and fresh and ready to start. And they get eventually to Sinai where they're now getting this baptism of spirit, which is the word of authority from above being given to them. Okay, they're given spirit. Okay, don't listen to this through charismatic ears. You won't understand a word I'm saying. It's, it's simply his nature being given to you as he then covenants with them at Sinai. So you have that part, right? And then they journey more through the wilderness and now they have the baptisms of fire. And there's many of them over and over again. And each time they learn something about themselves because these are pop quizzes, okay? And so that's what you have to understand is that, you know, when James talks about in verse one, um, in chapter one of James, that you should count a joy in a trial, it only makes sense in this context that the joy is that, hey, this is great. I hate the trial, but I get to show him how far I've come. This is me in a pop quiz between the father seeing, he's watching, he wants to see how I handle this. And he's either gonna look at me like, nope, you're not ready, or that was good, now you're ready to move to the next level, right? It's these pop quizzes. All you video game people, this is like the boss at the level. They gotta pass the trial, which is like the boss at the end of the level to get to the next level. You don't pass the trial, you're staying at that level, okay? And so bear in mind that when they were going through the wilderness, some of them passed each time. 
Not the same people necessarily, more and more in different ones. Each trial would pass. Now that first trial was when they were spying out the land. Out of 603,550, only two of them over age 20 of the men passed the test. Okay? And so others, I'm sure there were some that passed the test when they were hungry. There were some that passed the test when they were thirsty. There were some that passed various tests. Okay? But you have these things in your life. And some of you wonder, why does the same thing keep happening to me? Because you have not passed that test. When you pass that test, that will probably stop. And then other things will pop up. You still may get the old one every now and then just to make sure you're still in the right place. But it won't come up as frequently because that's the test you struggle with. You weren't able to count it joy. You weren't able to kind of get through it. You panicked and whatever you did, right? Okay? Had a bad attitude, whatever, threw a fit, whatever it was. Or got tempted and gave in or whatever the test was. Okay? And so Pete's completely right. I wanted to know, are you ready to make the journey? Okay? That's what I was teaching you. It was like, are you actually ready to go through putting you, the old you away, learning new things, adding them to the new you as you become Yeshua-like, and being tested all the time, over and over along the journey. Well, I thought once I came to Messiah, but no, that's where it all starts, not where it all ends, okay? Christianity lied to you. I know that's shocking, but they did, okay? Not about everything, but a lot. And it gave you a wrong mindset. It told you you could basically stay you and let him do everything for you. And that's just not gonna fly. It's a lie. You're gonna have to become him. You, the bride has to prepare herself. The bride has to make herself ready. Now, you're not just gonna make up what makes you ready and just decide, I mean, you're gonna actually be told what it's all supposed to look like and be like so that you can match the expectation, okay? All right, so like if I had a special wedding garment in mind for you, we we'll think this in the secular world. And I told you, but I want you to make the garment. It didn't give you any instruction. You make any old thing, whatever it is, no matter how nice it looks. I may not be happy with it because it's not what I told you. But if I'm going to give you the actual pattern, okay, like, like a clothing pattern for the dress so that you actually can cut out the pattern, do all the things, and, you know the, and I tell you what materials I want it made out of, I tell you what color I want it to be, I tell you what other adornments I want it to, I mean, now you can make what I gave you to make. See, some of you think he just told you, be good, whatever you think it is. Do right, whatever you think it is. And he's like, no. You're going to make yourself ready by doing what I told you to do and become the person I want you to be with your own personality and flavor, right? But we're going to conform into the behavioral, mental, emotional, spiritual image of the son. Let his mind how would he handle things, okay? So we're gonna do, we're gonna do that part, especially his level of submission and trust. I only do whatever the Father says he says. Nothing I do, nothing I say. And, but when he said that, he doesn't mean like every sentence and every word and every conversation, but he means that when I, when I say anything, it's gonna be in alignment with what he, you know, is all about. I'm not gonna say anything that's out of line with him. It doesn't mean that I'm gonna wait on him to put every word in my mouth. I'm sure I say things very differently than other people he's used over the centuries to say similar things. I say them with my personality. But it's still his words. And that's where the, you know, where the difference is. Okay, Marlene. I really appreciate how you speak for Yahweh, Rabbi. Um, the last few weeks I've been at home sick and uh, I've had uninterrupted uh, you know, I've been able to focus on what, what Yahweh has been saying through you. And <laughs> it's kind of interesting because I was in bed, you know, like, you, were, you would say whatever you would say. And I was like, Yahweh, I, I, I want to change. I want to I wanna do better. How? Show me how. And then you would say whatever, you know. You would give instructions. And I was like, okay, thank you. Yes, I can do that. Then I was like, but whatever. And then you would give more instructions. I was like, oh, Hallelujah. So um, one thing you told us to do was start doing affirmations to um, read them multiple times a day. And so I have my affirmations. And um, one of the thing, a few of the things I say in here is I have the mind of Yeshua. I stay in Yeshua and he stays in me. 
the Father and I are one. And I have a bunch of different, more specific things in here. But, um, and this is actually a revised version from when Isaiah came up here and you told him that his affirmations need to be more specific, you know. So I was like, oh, let me revise my affirmations. So anyway, when I say the Father and I are one, every time I say that, it, it gives me the fear of Yahweh. And um, because that's something I aspire to, or I have in my mind that I want to aspire to, but like, am I really willing to change right. enough to be one with the Father? And just today, I realized that it's possible that I can have the mind of Yeshua, and he and the Father were one, and I can be one with the Father. And I didn't realize that until today. And like last week, when I was spending time with Yahweh, one thing that uh, I, I started therapy because um, I wanted to find a way to disconnect my, my thoughts and my emotions. Before you were talking about how we needed to figure out our head and our, our emotions, you know. And so I felt really right on track with what you had been saying. So I was like, oh, hallelujah, I'm right on track. So um, one thing I realized recently is, and it goes with what you were saying about um, the heart, and like, you know, he knows my heart. In Jeremiah 17, verse 9 and 10, it says, the heart is crooked above all and desperately sick. Who shall know it? Yeah, we started the heart of the matter teaching off with that. I, I, didn't, know, I didn't know my own heart. Uh, I, Yahweh, search the heart and try the kidneys and give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds, which is exactly what you were saying. You're going to get what you, your decisions have, have, you know, all the decisions you make is going to be the door or not. So I just realized this week that I did not know my heart. And I had this mind, this idea of who I thought I was. And I wanted to be loosely whatever, you know, but not until I start really saying these things about who I really wanted to be. And like you said, think, think, think two weeks ago, um, to feel how you would feel after you become that person. Right. When I start really imagining myself on the other side of becoming, I realize this is the fear the Father and I are one. Because am I really willing to let go of all the stuff? Because it's familiar. Right. It's scary to decide that you're gonna let go of who you are, who you've always known yourself to be, even if it's something you don't like. I don't, I don't, I don't, this person Nobody that said I'm, leaving Egypt behind was yeah. easy. Leaving the old you behind is not going to be easy. If this person I'm trying to be, this person in my affirmations, this person that I'm yeah. trying to be, being one with the Father, thinking, like you said, you know, Yeshua thinks, doing what Yeshua does, disconnecting the emotions, submitting. Yep. He had emotions. He sweated blood in the, in the garden yep. with this decision he had to make with what he knew he had to do. But he got that under submission. He had a disciplined mind. Yep. So I'm realizing more and more that I don't know who I am. <laughs> <laughs> but you know who you want to become. I know who That's I want to be. Yeah, and, and he's exposed You're in who transition. I am. You're in Right. He's exposing who I am, and not until I see who I am can I even decide to leave that person behind. So I just want to thank you for this teaching, and I just feel like I'm on the path because what you've been saying these last few weeks have really been going with... Oh, another thing I want to just say <laughs> I had a revelation about is that um, my therapist have been giving me a protocol, and uh, when I was meeting with her... Uh, she would say, yeah, and, and have you done this yet? And have you done that yet? You know, you really need to do that. 
And I was like, yeah, yeah, okay, I'll do it, I'll do it, you know. And she kept telling me, you know, you really need to do this. Have you done this yet? Have you done, you know, this is really important. You really need to do this. And I thought, man, you're fucking dang annoying. Like, can you just shut up, you know? <laughs> and, and I didn't say that. And she's sweet as she can be. And I didn't say that, but I was thinking, it was wait, like Wait, 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 you did say it. You just didn't say it out loud. Did, that's correct. That is correct. I said it in my, inside myself. Yeah. And it was like sandpaper. And then I started thinking, she, it's like, a, it's like an annoying, like, like a hammer. Like people say you are, Rabbi. But she is sweet, 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 dripping honey sweet. And I'm like, this person is like annoying like sandpaper. So she's then, like me. Yes. Sweet, sweet, dripping honey. <laughs> No, but the thing that's like you is you say stuff that people think is annoying or they wish you would just stop talking about it. You keep hammering and hammering and hammering and won't stop. Because it's them, they need to change. Right. It's annoying because it's something they need to do that's good for them. Right. And they don't want to do it because they don't want to be a different person. Right. They don't want to let it go. And when I finally realized and did everything she told me to do, and I realized that that hammer, that itch, that scratch, that sandpaper, that annoying, like, would you please just shut up? <laughs> was me not wanting to let go of the old person and do what I need to do to be the new person. Absolutely. Then I felt free. Good. So now I'm working on that little by little, hallelujah. Good, good. All right, listen, listen. So, so first of all, you know, many, many times over the years I've said this. I've said, look, the teachings kind of are a filter, okay? Because you can't listen to these teachings over time and have them irritate you and either, either you do it, in which case they won't irritate you anymore, or it'll irritate you because you're not going to do it and you leave. And that's the same thing within, within the scripture here, you know? And, you know, it's interesting because I, I haven't told this joke in a long time, so I'll tell a joke, all right? So this, this uh, rabbi you know, is giving a message, and they, everybody loved it, thought it was great. And afterwards, you know, they go up to say, hey, rabbi, it's a great message and everything. And he said, okay, thank you, whatever. The next week, he comes back and gives the same exact message. But you know what? They thought it was still great. I mean, you know, hearing it twice, you know, sometimes you need to hear something more than once. They thought it was great. So they oh, yeah, great message and everything. Next week, gave the same message. That's three weeks in a row. Now they're wondering, did this, is Alzheimer's? Is he losing his mind? What's going on? He, three weeks in a row, the same message. I'm like, one of us needs to say something to the guy, you know? And so one of them finally went up to him and said, you know, Rabbi, we noticed you gave the same message now for three weeks. He said, yeah, what about it? He said, well, you know, is everything okay? He says, no problem. When you guys start doing it, I'll stop saying it. <laughs> you know? Which is why you find Yahweh saying the same thing over and over and over and over again, often enough in scripture, you know? Uh, one correction I would have, um, Marlene, I know it didn't affect you in your affirmations, but other people listening it may affect. If you're gonna say something like, the Father and I are one, well, that could make it sound possibly in your head like he's gonna be one with you as opposed to you with him. I would say, I am one with the Father, which you did say also, but that's not the way your affirmation read, okay? So I would word it more like, I am one with. Okay, because that makes you acknowledge that you're lining up with him. All right, so I would just word it that way a little bit differently. Um, look, I know this is very popular, this whole thing's like law of attraction and understanding these kind of things. Let me, let me explain something to you. You attract what you are. You don't attract what you think. You don't attract what you claim you believe. You attract what you are. So you have to become what you want and then you can attract what you want. I'm not saying that in a magical way. I'm just saying that's the law of reaping and sowing. Okay? Okay, you know, it's like when she, she read the verses from Jeremiah. You know, Jeremiah 17.9 is a verse that I would always use back in the past, especially when people like to say about their hearts, well, the heart is desperately sick or wicked or crooked or whatever, and who can know it, right? I mean, it's a mess. But also he says, you need to know that you're gonna reap what you sow. You're gonna, you're gonna end up getting what you, based on what you do. And that's throughout scripture, including the actual way that it's worded where Paul says, look, Elohim is not mocked. You're going to reap what you sow. Otherwise he'd be mocked, which means that what you do is going to cause, this is really the law of attraction. It's going to cause something to come in as reaction to your action, right? We know from science that actions have a reaction. Your thoughts are actions. So even though you thought in your mind, it didn't say it to that lady, it just still had an action that caused a reaction in you. Okay. But if you can become 
even at least in your mind and in your attitude, believing yourself to be Yeshua-like, then you'll start behaving more Yeshua-like. And you'll start attracting other things into your life. That's the way the Father designed it to work, okay? And so just understand. I mean, one day I'll do a whole teaching that kind of shows from Scripture how that actually is supposed to play out. But just so you know, you tend to have come into your life things that match what and who you are, not who you think you are, not who you want to be, but what you actually are. So you have to become, or at least really get your mind to see yourself, because then you'll start acting and being that new person. The problem with them when they came out of Egypt is that they could not see themselves anything but slaves. They still couldn't see themselves as free. They couldn't see themselves as dealing with an actual trustworthy Elohim versus the rocks and stones and stupidity that they had in, in Egypt, right? They, I mean, they could not see themselves in this new way. And Marlene said that was part of the challenge. She realized some of the things she was dealing with. She just could not see herself. She was still seeing herself as the old thing. And the old, the old you does not die easy. <laughs> There's parts of it maybe, the rest of it's gonna go down with a fight. Kicking and screaming, you know. This is, you know, you're just gonna be like, man, I plunged a knife in it, a dagger in it, a stake in it, or whatever, silver bullet, it still keeps getting back up. Yeah, you're gonna have to keep kicking that sucker back down. Because it won't die till you really want it to die. That's the problem, okay? You still have certain things that, well, you know, we didn't have it so bad in Egypt. You know, the food we had to abundance. No, you didn't. But you're convincing yourself that somehow the old you was doing great. But that was a lie. So until you stop wanting all of that and still emotionally being attached to it, it's still going to keep rearing its head because you give it life. As soon as you don't want it anymore, it has no more life. It's just like all the people I know that quit cigarettes, that did it, most of them just did it cold turkey. They just quit. You know why? Because at some point they didn't want them anymore. Their body still wanted them, but they didn't. So it wasn't that tough. Go ask Rabbi Tom. He quit that way. Ask others. He just decided, I'm done. Okay? But if you really still want it, it's, then you're just trying. You're not quitting. Quitting is no trying. You just quit or you don't quit. Don't tell me, well, I tried to quit many times. No, you didn't. You tried to convince yourself that you, that you want to do something you really didn't want to do. That's what trying means. I really don't want to do this, but I know I need to, so I'm going to try. No. Quit. Knock it off. Quit the old you, whatever old you habits need to quit. Bury that old you and stop wanting it to, it to have breath of life in it. Because you're the one who breathes life back into it. Amen? Okay? So I just want to make sure we, co we cover those things. All right. Okay, Annabelle. Hi, Rabbi. Hi. <clears throat> well, I got... I Put guess, the mic right up. I got, I guess, um, more like a comment, I guess, that you just blow my mind on all kinds of things. And that's why I call you the, the flesh killer. <laughs> because you literally kill the flesh. <clears throat> I now, know wait, hold on. He, the word, is the flesh killer. I yes. just speak it with a lot of power, but it's, I'm not killing anything. Right? It's the words, his words, that are the flesh killers. Yep. Okay, but I do it as a prophet, meaning I speak it with authority. So that's the power of it is because it's with authority, right? Yes, sir. And I thank Abba for you for being that vessel is the one that I needed to get straight or getting there anyway. But um, I remember when I first started listening to you, I, I heard get out the leaven. And, uh, and I was like, okay, so I'm gonna take everything out, everything I've ever learned in Christianity and, and Catholic and all that, all that stuff. And I'm gonna put it over here and I'm gonna set it up as in jars, kind of like, and then whenever you, whenever Abba uses you to tell me to pick it back up, I can pick it back up. But I have to get permission to do that. And I um, know when, when I was working, I would get 14 hours a day and I was able to listen to teaching after teaching after teaching after teaching. So I could go through series. And during them series, it was like a machine gun. Just there goes all, all the jars, you know. <laughs> and then recently you busted another jar and I was like, wow, I'm not going to have nothing. I can't pick nothing up. Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Look, all of you need to pay attention to something really important that she said, okay? Some of you are going about this with the wrong 
process. You should take everything and lay it down or put it in a jar or whatever. Don't hold on to things until I shoot a hole in it. Put everything down and decide whether or not it's okay to pick it back up. It's much easier to do that than to hold on to something and decide to let go of it later. Get the emotion out of it so that you put it down. Put everything you believe down, and one by one you'll pick them up as you recognize that those are okay. Because some things you had were okay, but the ones that weren't, weren't. But that approach that she had, that's the right approach. And I've said that in some of the teachings, okay? Put everything down first, okay? Don't have me teach something and you're wrestling about wanting to let it go or not while I'm shooting at it. <laughs> and I'm a pretty good shot, I'll hit it, okay? And if you're holding it too close, I'll hit you. Because you might need that because you're trying to hold on to this stupid thing. Okay, go ahead. And so <clears throat> this teaching is like awesome, awesome. But um, during uh, Purim, or I don't know how to say it. Purim. Purim. Um, we were reading the book of Esther, and my daughter was uh, talking about, Mom, we need to do a Bible study. And I told her, I said, well, you know, the feast is coming up. I said, so let's read that. And as I was reading um, in chapter two, <clears throat> it talks about <clears throat> they sent her to the, to the eunuch, right? Yeah. And um, it says, he's the guardian of women. And I think when I was reading this, I was thinking of you being that guardian because we are considered the bride so we're considered the woman, but I was thinking personally for me that you are the guardian that, that I was assigned to follow. And um, you know, they, it wasn't easy. They did 12 new moons of preparation. So as, as I'm thinking with the, with the teaching and everything, with the preparation of having to go through all these 12 12 months, but she received loving commitment. And that resonated that if I follow what my guardian is telling me, I'm going to receive that loving commitment. And, and, and in uh, 15, it says, and Esther found favor in his eyes. And that's what I'm looking for, his favor in his eyes. So I have to follow the guardian that he's placed in my life. And I just, and just thank Abba every day for you and for being, for you following the call that he called you to do. Because if it was, if it would, if you would have disobeyed, you had the choice to decide whether to do it or not to do it. And I'm so happy that you did because this is where it's brought me further to him. Amen. See, see, uh, Elder, it's, it's good I didn't quit last Thursday, so I just, I, I almost did. It was close. No, I'm kidding. Now, look, look, you got to understand, um, first of all, I really appreciate the uh, encouraging words, because this is something that we strive very hard to do in our ministry, is to be that protective covering, right? And it's funny, because so many people leave, say that we're unsafe, and this, that, and everything, because we're, we're not safe is for their flesh. They're, they're the flesh that doesn't want to die, we're not safe for that. And their emotions that don't want to get dealt with, we're not safe for that, which is fine. That's proper. And so that's why they say, but if you're here to do, look at this correctly, then we're the safest place in the world. Now, that being said, you know, when we looked at this thing in Esther, you know, it talks about, for the days of the preparation were complete as follows. Six months with oil of myrrh, and the six months with perfumes and with preparations of women, and all these, so... What I just got out of that, pulling that out real quick is, when the women were doing just the myrrh, they weren't doing nothing else. I mean, they were doing all their other normal stuff, but they focused on this one thing that was new that they were doing, and did it for six months. Then they did this other thing for the next six months. You might want to just pick something that is important, new, and needed in your life, and focus on that with the most focus while you're doing other things for a period of time. Okay, because she used the metaphor of these women preparing themselves that she was getting out of the book of Esther. Just a thought, you know, work on a lot of different things, but have that one thing you're really going to focus on. Not at the expense of other things, but that one thing. 
This next couple of months, I'm just gonna make sure, I'm gonna keep doing this stuff too, but this is gonna be my focus, beating this problem, getting my head right in this area, whatever it is, so that you're not aiming at like 12 things. So I thought that was interesting that it just mentioned one thing, the oil of myrrh. That's all, that's all they were doing for six months. Now I'm sure they were doing other things too, but I mean, that's the thing that they're saying. That's the primary difference from everything else they were doing is they did this one thing. Okay. So figure out what that one thing is you need to do for the next couple of months, that one critical thing. And then move on, because then it said after that, then with the other preparations of women and perfumes and everything else. So there's one really important thing, six months just focused on it, and then we can do other things. So that, once that's out of the way, we got more e ease of, of time and space and mental capacity, emotional capacity, to move on and do other things. All right? All right, Frederick. I really liked your response to the, the, the often Christian background complaining, oh, but he loves me. And I have a wording that I use to help remind me not to go back there, and it's that he uses this as you wish, and I'm going to expand on that so you know what I mean, but it's as you have demonstrated by your actions that you wish whether to have a relationship with him or not. Right. As you wish. That's very nice. He's not going to force you to have a relationship with him. As you desire. As, yeah. As, as something that you actually As you've demonstrate. demonstrated that you... Yes one way or another, as you wish. Look, and I, I really appreciate that, but just to the first thing you said, you know, where it says, well, but he loves me. Look, all of you who have got children, I bet you would agree with this, right? I love both my children. If any of them ever went off into la-la land, whatever, out into the world, I would still love them. They may never come back. I would still love them. Okay, that's the way the father is too. He loves you. He's not going to force anything. I'm not, I'm not going to do anything, anybody good to go out there and try to drag them back. Now, the father has one advantage that I don't have is that he can cause little things to happen in their lives to try to get their attention that I can't do. Okay. But when you say the father loves you, of course, he loves everything he's made. But how he expresses it may not be the way you think. All right. But he loves me. So it doesn't mean that he's not going to let you go off into whatever and end up in death. He's not, it doesn't, he didn't say that. If that's your choice and you end up whatever, then you end up whatever. That doesn't mean he's going to stop loving you. Any of you have had children lo lose their lives to, to stupidity, violence, drugs, or something, you still love your child. And they made their choices. And your loving them did not stop them from ending up dead or in some sort of damaged condition or whatever, right? You still love them though. But he's God, yes, and he loves you, but he's allowing you to make choices. You get to choose how your life plays out. And some of you haven't really embraced that yet because you'll call us up and it'll be like, well, I got this decision to make and I just want to do whatever he wants. And then I say, well, what do you want? Well, I just want whatever he wants. I said, no, I'm not playing that game. I always have to say that. I said, no, we are not playing that game. What do you want? Okay? Because if you really want what he wants, you'll pick something that is in line with his framework. Because he doesn't give any verses in here that says what career you have to have, or what your car needs to look like, or what kind of housing you need to live in. What he does say, as long as what you want doesn't conflict with his framework. So owning a car doesn't conflict with his framework, so you can own anyone you want. You can have an apartment, you can have a house, you can live in a tent. It doesn't conflict with anything that he says here. In other words, realize it's about, you have to figure out what you want. Problem is you're lazy. In your mind, you're lazy. You don't want to make decisions. You love the idea in Christianity that everything was going to be done for you, and whatever was done that wasn't done for you, that was bad, was done by the evil one, so you didn't have to do anything. Stop being a lazy thinker. You're here to make choices. If you don't make choices, you're failing. How do you make choices? Well, you got to start figuring out what you want. What do you want? I want to be in the kingdom. Good. Then make choices. That'll get you there. He tells you how to get there. Here's the road map. I want to get married someday. Well, then make the choices to become a person that's marriageable. All right? I want to, I want to own a business. Then make choices to own a business. But don't, always, don't throw it back to, I want to do what he wants. Find out first, is anything that I want in conflict with him? It doesn't say anywhere in here that you should have a business or not have a business. All right, well, then you obviously you can have a business. 
but do you want one? Okay, I want this, I want that, good. As long as check first, is there anything about this? You can call me, hey, I wanted to go do this, is there anything you're aware of that that's a problem? And I'll say yes or no. But you gotta first come and say, I wanna do this, I wanna have this, or I wanna become this, whatever it is, and I can let you know if that's a problem. But you first have to decide what it is you want. <laughs> And by I decide, I mean you gotta decide. See, a lot of you, that expectation thing where it says, let us hold fast the confession of expectation, Hebrews 10, 23. Do you have an expectation? Do you really want something like ex with expectancy? So that's another big piece of that whole law of attracting. You gotta expect it. Because you're not gonna do all the things necessary if you don't expect it. You know? Look, I could say I expect to own an apartment building someday. I'll just pick something out, you know, or I expect to own a restaurant. And you know what, if I do zero things to look into how to do that, I'm never gonna own one. But if I really expect it, I'm gonna go and do the things that I'll learn how, it, what a restaurant's all about and what, how do you own a bit, what does it cost, what is it, how do I prepare for that, what do I need to know, right? Why would you expect something you're not gonna put any effort into? I expect to get 100 on the exam, but I'm not gonna study anything or go to class. And why would you expect to get 100 then? But if I expect for myself to get 100, because that's my expectation is that I will get 100, that means I have to do the work to get 100. I have to do the work to become a great husband. I gotta do the work to be a great rabbi. I gotta do the work to be a great father. I gotta do, because I expect that I'm gonna be, I tell my children, I expect that I'm gonna get the Father of the Year award every year, okay? I'm gonna do what I need to do to earn that, because I expect I'm gonna get it. I'm not expecting them to just give it to me. I'm expecting that I will be husband of the year. I will be rabbi of the year, whatever. Which means I have to work at it. I'm not expecting someone just to give it to me. See, Christianity makes it sound like you're just expecting him to give you eternal life because you figured out he exists. Good for you. Why would he do that? Even the demons and the devil know he exists. So what's the point? All right? So when it comes to expectation, he says, look, I'm gonna hold fast to confession of my expectation, which means I expect I will do my part knowing he's trustworthy, okay? I expect that, you know? Just like I told my children when we used to go on vacation, do everything I say on this vacation and I, you can expect to have the best vacation ever, but you need to listen. My, go, my job that you need to trust is I will give you the best fun experience beyond what you could imagine, but you gotta follow directions, okay? And over time they learned that it worked. So I said, look, you gotta follow, you gotta follow directions because then I know you're safe and everything I have to do. And if you do that, I wanna I'll take you on vacation. My goal is that you just go home going that was the greatest thing ever, okay? That's kind of what we have to have you know, in our minds is, you have to do what you need to do for your expectation. He's telling you his part, if you do your part, is done deal. You don't have to worry about that. He's trustworthy. All right, Taylor? Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Um, can I have two if one is short? Sure, okay. and just keep the mic close to your mouth. Okay, um, so in the past with like, um, with being the person that I wanted to be and becoming um, whatever it was, now it's becoming Yeshua-like and trying to get to the kingdom. I would actually, I wouldn't consider it lying, but when people would come to me in conversation and they would talk around topics that I wanted to change, I would tell them the result <laughs> of what I wanted. And instead of saying like, oh, right now I'm struggling or I'm going through this and trying to, I would never speak like that. I would always say it in a different thing. So my first question is, with Torah, you know, I don't want to be like deceitful. Is there a different way to do that? Because in the past it would work. It would change my mindset if I was talking in the present tense with people about what I wanted. But is there a different like All right. or a way to I do that? I think, and now I know the law of attraction gurus and whatever don't like you to say thing in the I want or I will. Yeah. But if you're going to do that out loud with accountability, then your integrity and your hypocrisy levels are gonna be challenged if you don't actually do things towards it. Mm -hmm. So if I go around and tell everybody, I will open a business or something, whatever it is. I will pay off all my bills except my house. I will, well, 
saying it out loud a lot is also an accountability thing for you because now you keep having to say, okay, I said it out loud again, what am I doing to make that happen? All right, because I'm gonna look real stupid if I don't do it. It's a matter of how much you care about looking stupid. It would be more so, not more so with like in results like that, but like character things. Yeah. So if somebody would say, come and they knew me as somebody who was like super, super anxious, I would say, okay, I'm not that person or I act like that. So is that, is that wrong? Well, you can say, look, that's not the person that I am truly. I'm, I'm not there yet. That's where I'm going. That's fine. Look, let's say like for me, the one thing I, I work, I've been working on and I've been doing really well with it, really. And I'm not saying that with any kind of you know, false humility, but I've had anger issues. A lot of people have anger issues. And, but I've told people, I said, look, I'm going to work on this. I am working on it. And, but they have to see the results. And if you ask the people that are close to me, they've seen that I've made progress there, right? So I'm just saying is, it's all well and good to say, but there should be evidence of it that you should expect that those people, when you have a conversation a month or two down the road, see that you're actually making progress. What if I'm the only person that sees the progress and they can't? Well, then, then you gotta be careful saying things that other people can't see. Okay. Then just keep that to yourself. Got you. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be saying things out loud that it's not gonna be evident in some way, because then how can you prove it anyway? Yeah. Okay. People will just like, it'll be random things. If somebody asks me about my life, I don't wanna, sorry, I don't wanna speak of it in that way, like when it does come up. So it's not- Right, but you, like can, you can just say, look, that's, if you wanna say something like, that's not me, well, it may still be a little bit me, but that's not me, that's not who I'm becoming, that's not where I'm headed. Yeah. That's the old me. Okay. Okay, I mean, so that's all well and good. I'm just saying is, you have to have set that expectation that that is not where you're going. Mm -hmm. That it's a temporary manifestation of what you are in this little window right now, maybe what you used to be, but that's not what you're going to be. Got you. But that you are reinforcing, and because I'm actively working on it. Mm. Okay? Okay. All right, so and the next question is, um, in the end, when someone, say, doesn't make it, and is thrown to the fire, and he destroys someone, um, so I'm under the thought process that we're all connected with him in some way. So when he does destroy somebody, does he destroy the rebellious part of that person? Or is it like a part of himself that is like gone at that point? Look, I think, I like that you ask the simple questions. The, the light, no depth to them, you know. No, look, these are good questions. And I'd love to have these conversations. I'm not sure they want to do it live stream and try to have to really give an in-depth you know, answer, only because we don't have the time for that. But let me give a quick answer, which is this. I think that the, 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 me the message that we're getting from here, from the scriptures, okay, is that at the end, if you are no longer going to be like given the eternal life kingdom thing, that your consciousness, awareness, is done, because the body dies anyway. So it's not so much, in other words, that whatever makes you you can be put in another body, okay? And so what he's simply saying is that you doesn't get put in another body. It just ceases to have conscious awareness, whatever that, I mean, look, it's an amoeba trying to understand a human being, we're trying to understand him, right? So I can't but guess, right? But I'm just saying is my guess is that since our essence of what we are can be put in another body, that what he's saying is, if you don't choose this path, you don't get another body. You don't get tortured forever, you just don't get another body and your conscious awareness stays in sleep mode or just non-awareness, okay? All right, that's kind of like, because look, if you were asleep and never woke up, you wouldn't get frustrated, you wouldn't be bothered, you wouldn't know, you'd just be existing in sleep mode somewhere, right? So that could be, because I don't think there's a destruction, right, because you know energy, which is mostly where all energy doesn't ever get destroyed, it changes form, all these kind of things. He may reuse that energy into something else that doesn't have conscious awareness, okay? I don't know, but he's simply, in my understanding, he's not giving you another body to consciously live in. Does that make sense, does that help? Okay. So that was my simple answer to the quantum physics of the universe, all right? Okay, because what he's talking about here has to do with a conscious awareness and having some sort of physical manifestation in some sort of a body, okay? You'll have some sort of form. Conscious awareness in form, okay? All right, interesting. All right, live stream.
All right, uh, from Monique Edwards. Uh, Rabbi, please check my understanding uh, on Hebrews uh, 4.12. In separating between the spirit of man and spirit of Elohim and coming to a place that we know that he really sees us, this should help us get out the leaven hypocrisy in us, correct? Yes. Okay. All right, uh, from Freddie G., uh, if we're in a place we believe makes it difficult to leave our old selves behind and leaving our current place is temporarily impossible, what can we do in the meantime to improve and become the new us? Okay, so if we're in a place that makes it difficult, but leaving the current place is temporarily impossible. All right, so key word, temporary, all right? So make every effort to make the temporary impossibility become possible. In the meantime, do the best you can to grow. Look, there may be only so much you can do in certain places, all right? If I live in a certain town where there's no work, I can't do anything where there's no work, but I can do whatever I can to eventually get out of that town. If right now it's impossible, I have to do all the things necessary to make it possible. So if you believe that doing it where you live now is not really ideal to what you're trying to do and you really can't accomplish it, fine. If it's difficult. By the way, you said difficult, which means it's not impossible. You said was leaving your current location is impossible at the moment. Work on creatively coming up with possible. Okay? Okay, if the place you lived in right now blew up and nobody was insurance was never going to put it, you know, it wasn't going to give you a new one or anything else, what would you do? I mean, I don't, I don't know why people react like things are impossible that are not impossible. Okay, Israel packed what little they had on their backs and walked out. Walked out. You're telling me you can't afford to rent a truck or this and that and everything. You, look, whatever you got, you can have in your pocket, walk out and go. I mean, you can do whatever you need to do. Look for work somewhere else, take 15 jobs, whatever you need to do. Some of you are not working enough to fix your impossible problems. Those temporary impossibles can be fixed with money. And the way you fix money is you go work more. Because what you're telling me when it's temporarily impossible is that either one of two things is happening. There's a family member you don't think you can leave behind or you don't have enough money to make the move or you don't have the job to make the move. Those are the three things, right? Your family members, okay, I want to tell you a little thing I, I saw the other day, okay? Maybe this will help you guys a lot. Some of you guys worry about what family members are going to think of what you do, friends are going to think about what you do. How many of you can name your great-grandparents? Okay, a very small percentage. How many of you can name your great-great-grandparents? Less hands. You actually know their names, first and last. Wow, okay. What about one generation back from there? One hand. Okay, the point is this, in, in like one or two generations, nobody's gonna remember anything about you, your name or anything you did. So what do you care about what they think? Okay, and how much do you really know about anything your great grandparents or great great grandparents did? Very little, I'm sure, okay? Especially the little mundane life decisions where they might have been embarrassed. Do you know about all of that stuff? No, because nobody cares. But so, some of you are thinking, well, I can't leave, you know, my children because they, they just can't take care of themselves. I said, how old are your children? 30 and 35. Leave them. Work on you. Maybe they'll actually wake up and take care of themselves. Well, but they'll not survive. Well, maybe they need to not survive. Wow, that's so cruel. Well, you're not helping anything. If they can only survive because of you, what benefit is that? I mean, be honest, does that really benefit anything? I'm not talking about a totally disabled handicapped situation. Bring them with you. I'm talking about someone who just doesn't know how to adult, which is most of, you know, 40 and under, <laughs> okay? Because almost all the counseling I have, I'm sorry to embarrass all of you, is because you guys can't adult. Elder's smiling, he doesn't want to laugh, he doesn't want anybody to see him laughing but you guys struggle to adult. And you won't leave your children and let them adult. You know what, go back 
enough generations and you'll find somebody that needed to adult left some country to move here and left everybody else behind. Even a spouse just to get started here first. Oh, but I can't leave my mother. Why? Bring her with you. I mean, find a solution. Well, I don't have a job there. Find one. You know, you can go online and find a job before you move here. All right? And if you can drive, I don't want to hear nothing. Go get Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, Instacart, all of those things, Uber Eats, Uber, all of it. Get all of those things and drive and make yourself. I know everybody I know that's doing that is making at least $20, $25, $30 an hour. Okay? Everybody. At least. And I know guys making two, three hundred dollars a day doing that. And they switch between whichever one they know is better during times of day or whatever they're doing. Do that whenever you're not doing your job. And bring that with you and you can do it in the new town the day you get here. If you've got enough hours in these things, you could start anywhere all right away. But you guys don't want to work. So you tell me current, you know, our current place is temporarily impossible to leave. Fix it. You said temporary, so you didn't say permanent. So spend all your attention on how to fix it. If I told you, this is the kind of one of those things, that I would give you $100,000 if you could be here in a new place with a job by July 1st, you'd do it. You'd figure it out. Or if I said I'd give you a million dollars. If you knew that, if you believed me, I said, all you have to do is be moved here and taking care of yourself. Not needing my money to do it, but like actually living. Moved here, job living. And actually, tell you what, you'd have to live for six months to prove you could take care of yourself, then I'd give you the money. You'd figure it out. Don't tell me you wouldn't figure it out. Well, I don't know. You'd figure it out. Nobody helped me. Elder, did anybody help you? No, nobody helped him. All right? I talked to all the successful people in the room. Nobody helped them. Now, they went and got advice because they asked for it. Nobody helped them. Okay? I don't know what to do. No, they didn't know what to do either. I never knew what to do. I just figured things I wanted to try and what I wanted to, and I gave it a shot. Well, I'm afraid. What if I fail? You're going to fail sometimes. Stop being afraid of it. My gosh. Everybody more successful you, successful than you has one thing is that absolutely they all have in common. They failed more than you were willing to fail. I promise you that's true. Everybody more successful than you in whatever area is only more successful than you. Not because they're more talented or they're smarter or somebody handed them something on a silver platter. No, they were willing to fail more than you're willing to fail. That's it, period. I failed a lot. All right, ask Elder, he's failed a lot. We made a lot of mistakes, lost lots of money. I probably have lost more money than you've ever made. Okay, I'm just saying. Trying things that didn't work. Or worked for a while and then blew up. But, but you have to be willing to try. And not be afraid of failure. Okay, so focus, Freddie G, on the temporary part. Fix that. Temporary, temporary, by the way, should mean a year or less, okay? Don't tell me something's temporary that's like five years out. Then you're not really looking at it right. You should be able to fix things quicker than that, okay? All right, in the meantime, don't tell me because it's difficult you can't do it where you are. You can. You can. We're doing it now in a less than ideal. We're not in the land as a cohesive nation. This isn't ideal. It's difficult. If everybody was keeping Torah and covenant, it would be a lot easier, right? So it's difficult, figure it out, do it. Dig your heels in and make it happen, all right? One of these days when I do the level up part two and you guys all need to come and take that and it's gonna be a, a monthly sort of, I'm gonna be smacking you like you wouldn't never heard of. You talk about being irritated like Marlene talked about, you're gonna hate me. Cause I'm gonna drive you nuts till you do it and you do it and you do it. And worse, you're gonna be mad cause you're gonna be paying me for that. You're gonna pay me to drive you nuts. Okay? You are. Because that's why people get personal trainers. 
Somebody says, they're not going to hear you go, well, I don't feel like it. Shut up. Do it. Let's go. I don't want to hear it. But I'm tired. So what? Suck it up. Do it. That's it. You know. This is, you know, the, the greatest game in existence. And you're, and you're losing. Because you're not willing to put in the effort to succeed. This is not... A, a, a just glide through it sort of thing, all right? Now, some of you are older and you think that, well, what can I do? Just find ways to do what you can do. It doesn't have to be lucrative and money. It has to do with do the inner battle, do the inner growth at that point. Be content that you are wherever you are because they, you know, it's too late to fix that, okay? I'm running out of time here. Let me just say this. I want to get the attention of all you 20 and 30-year-olds especially, Maybe 40. But certainly your 20 and 30 year olds. You're not going to really want to hear this. But I need you to know that 50 is coming. I need you to know that 60 is coming. And if you think you want to spend all your money on some d dumb fun thing on a, on a Saturday night or whatever it is right now, you're going to be miserable when you got nothing at 60 and are broke. And can't pay your bills and can't go out and do nothing because you're thinking, oh, when I retire, I'm going to do all this stuff. Retire with what? <laughs> I'm looking at you. I'll look up at the camera here. I'm looking at you. I'm looking at the screen so I can see. I'm looking at you. I wish somebody had really gotten my attention and I would have, I did a lot at 20 and 30. I didn't do as much as I could have. I mean, I didn't, I didn't even scratch the surface of what I could have. And I did more than most of you. Okay? And I'm like, oh man, if I'd only known that I was going to get to 50 and 60 and not have, I just figured oh, I'm just going to be rich. Well, but I didn't do what was going to make that happen. Oh, but Yeshua's coming. Maybe not by the time you're 50 and 60. Don't tell me about it now. It's end time. She's coming next month. Forget that. Okay? Not happening. All right? Not coming this year. There's too many things that have to happen. But all of you, I, I, I said I'd even include the 40s. I'd even include the 50s. I'm doing things now that I wish I had done because I expect to be 90 or 100. And I want it to be great without any stress about money or anything else. Wouldn't it be great to do whatever you want, whenever you want, for as long as you want, and not worry about the cost of it? Well, why can't you make that happen? If you're at 20, you can make it happen. As a matter of fact, you can make it happen starting by the time you're 40. You don't have to wait till you're 60 and things are starting to break and not work right. People are thinking, I'm going to have this great retirement. Then you wait till 65 and your body don't even allow you to have any of that fun anyway. You know. Go and make that happen now. Oh, but I like to go hang out with my friends. Do that when, you know what? You're going to want to hang out with your friends when you're 50. But you won't be able to because you're going to be over this like this with your bills. And your friends are going to want, the ones that did figure it out, they're going to want to go on a cruise. They're going to want to go do this. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I, I can't. I'm broken. I got to work. Okay? Pay the price. You got to pay it anyway. But if you pay it early, later could be great. You don't pay it until later, it's never going to be great. I know you're not focused on this world now, but you got to live in it. Why not make it as good as you can make it? I mean, your world, not the whole world. I mean, there's only so much we can do for the whole world. I mean, it's, it's all hell bent on where it's going. But you have an expectation that you're going to live to be 70 or 80 years old, which the average life now is most people getting into their 80s and 90s. The technologies and everything out there, we, we tend to live longer. And it seems to keep getting better and better. So by the time if you're 20, you might, everybody's living to 100 by then. But I'm telling you, you want to start having that freedom of choice younger. Okay, if I could talk to the young me right now, the 20-year-old me, I would say, those ideas you're doing, that's great, but you're not doing enough. Because some of you think, listen, I gotta tell you something. You young kids can figure this out. This is 1980, all right? 1980 we're talking. So just imagine what dollars were worth in 1980. 1980 when minimum wage was like, what, four bucks or something, okay? Maybe, all right, three and a half, okay? 1980, I started DJing private parties, all right? I was 
17 years old, going to 18 years old, 80, 81. I started DJing parties, 81 maybe. And I was making $150 an hour for a three hour party, four hour party, I was making, think about it, $600 in a night, 600 bucks. Most of you don't make that in a week. I was making it in a night in 1981, 1980. Guess what I did the rest of the week when I didn't have a gig? Nothing. I had a lot of money for a kid. I did nothing with all that extra time. And I didn't even work every week because only whenever people schedule parties. But you know what? I could make $600 in one night and that's more than most people I knew were making in three weeks. Because when I was getting paid that minimum wage, I was making $120 a week, 40 hour a week. Okay, 320, 315 an hour, $123 a week, whatever. So I'm, that's a month I was making in one night. And it ruined me. I could have done so much more. So if some of you think, oh, I'm doing great. For what? Work every available minute you have to work. Okay, period. Pay the price now. I was a lazy whatever because I made all this good money and did nothing with it. Now, I taught myself how to do this business. I learned how to do it. I bought all the equipment. I spent a lot of money. Bought all the records. You had to buy records back then. And get yourself a milk crate to put them in. All the DJs used the milk crates, you know? Some of you are like, what's a milk crate? All right. Okay. Well, we also had a milkman delivering the milk in the milk crates. Okay. So, you know, but I would go back and tell my younger me, Get out there and just, blinders, okay? Kill it, just kill it. All you single guys, stop looking for the ladies right now. You got nothing to offer them anyway, you young guys. What are you gonna offer them? You kill it first and they're all gonna come looking at you. Go out there and kill it first, all right? Because then you got something to offer. See, all you're offering now is Believe in me, I've got potential. <laughs> I'm going to be rich. What are you doing now? Nothing. You know, okay? I, watch, I play video games and I, I, and I watch Instagram and whatever. I mean, what, what are you doing? Okay? All right, so kill it. Just focus and kill it. Ladies, become, first of all, all you ladies younger too? You need to be able to take care of yourself. Yeah, one day hopefully a man will come and take care of you. But what if he doesn't? What if he does and very quickly something adverse happens that you didn't expect and now you're on your own again? Yep. Ladies, you need to be able to take care of yourselves. My daughter can take care of herself. And I told Ben, you need to be able to take care of her so she doesn't have to. That's what you need. My wife can take care of herself. But she doesn't need to. All right? But you can. I wouldn't marry anybody who couldn't take care of themselves. A whole different quality of person when they can take care of themselves. A whole different level of maturity, a whole little, different mindset. I got a mindset of success. I don't want to marry somebody that doesn't already have the same mindset. She had bigger goals than anybody in her family growing up and she knew where she wanted to go. And by the way, nobody helped her. Matter of fact, they discouraged her. She wanted to be the first one to go to college. They didn't want anybody to go to college. What are you going to college for, right? And got herself, you know, uh, an assistance license and a hygiene license and was able to start a career, a very well-paying career. But you guys, you're aiming at the kingdom? Some of you are like, well, that's Shabbat. Why are you talking about all this? Because it's a mindset. You're, you're not gonna do this successfully if you're not doing anything else successfully. There's the connecting point. Let me scare a few of you or inspire you. You're not going to do this successfully if the rest of your life is a train wreck. But if you can get your life going, you can get this going, everything needs to be going in the right direction. I'm, I'm just making it. Now, some of you say, well, I've already screwed my life up. I'm 75 years old. Well, fine. Do the best with what you have now to make what you have now work in all areas of your life, okay? No, maybe now it's too late to build all these things and whatever, fine. But make what you have now work the best it can. Get guidance, that's the only way. Everything I did, I got guidance. You know, I ended up being a DJ. I was at 
I was working at this Casco Mountain Hotels. I was working as a coordinator of activities on during the holidays and stuff, right, for the kids. And they had a DJ party. And I went and met the guy who was about my age. I think I was 17, whatever. And we're talking. And he told me how much money he could make. I said, no way. How do you, how do, you do this? And so he taught me. But I had to ask him, hey, and he only taught me because he was way up in upstate New York and I wanted to do it in New York City. And he would come down and help me do gigs that he booked in Manhattan. And then eventually he couldn't make the trip. It was too far a drive. And I just took over the business and I bought my own equipment. But he showed me how to do it. But I asked him, okay? And he only did it once or twice with me. I really had to figure it out on my own, okay? I knew the ideas, but I had to practice, you know? Okay, and so all of you need to understand the same thing with every aspect of life, including the spiritual part, okay? How are you gonna be successful in the biggest thing there is in existence if you can't be successful even in just managing your everyday life, okay? You gotta to learn to manage your life. If you can't control what you eat or what you smoke or what you indulge in, then how are you supposed to control, how are you supposed to be in the kingdom? Do you think anybody in the kingdom is gonna lack discipline? Almost all of you do. I, I look, as I'm very disciplined, and I still lack this. I would, I would still be hard on myself and say I lack discipline. And I probably have more than most of you to do what I do. I still am not satisfied that I actually am as disciplined as I should be. Okay? Elder would say the same thing about himself. All right? And I can promise you, watching him, he's a very disciplined man. But I bet you if you asked him, he's going to say, no, not, yet, not there yet. I'm disciplined more than I was before. But there's still areas I'm not there yet. But if all of your areas are not, then what are you going to do? Okay? What are you going to do? I think, I think that, you, you, you know, you need to start confessing the expectation of having discipline in your life. And being able to actually focus all the decision making you need to make and aligning it with his framework. All right? That's all because Freddie asked that question. <laughs> because you don't get to do the things he's asking without all the rest of the stuff I just gave you. Because even success could derail you. I got derailed because I made a lot of money at a young age doing very little. Okay? And sometimes I worked Friday night and Saturday. I wasn't keeping Sabbath back then. So I'd make like $1,000, $1,200 in a weekend. Oh my gosh. I don't think that lasted very long either as a young kid. All right? <laughs> but I was not maximizing, okay? Because I had, I thought I was doing great compared to everybody else I knew, and I was. I was making a whole lot more money than they were. But man, if I had killed it at the same time, and did something like, if I had had a regular job and just did that on the weekend? Are you kidding me? No, instead I just hung out with people in college just partying, having fun. Because I thought, I make plenty of money, I got nothing else to do. As a matter of fact, I didn't even go to class because I didn't care that I spent, I just was hanging out. Because I was there just to have a good time. But I never thought about being married with kids and being 50 years old or 60 years old someday down the road. I couldn't see that far. I was already better than everybody where I was. Yeah, but that's, now what happens later? Well, if I don't keep elevating it, I'm not, I'm gonna, when I'm making it 30, that, that thousand a week, which was a lot, wasn't a lot if I was 50 with, you know, with three kids and a wife, okay? Matter of fact, you couldn't live in New York City with 50. You couldn't rent anything, okay? You, you could, just couldn't do it. You know, the last apartment my wife and I had in New York, which was back in 20, 2008 or something, 2009, it was $30,000 a year to rent, 2,500 a month. And that wasn't a fancy place. That was just normal for a three-bedroom apartment, okay? Some of you don't make 30000 a year. We were paying that for rent. What kind of game do you think you need to elevate <laughs> just to pay that kind of rent? That didn't include food, utilities, or anything. So yeah, you got forced to try to do something. It wasn't ideal. It was difficult, Freddie. <laughs> All right? Is what it is. All right, live stream. You got anything else? I went long. Uh, I think we have... We have Three more, but I think only one of them's quick. So uh, from Delia Alonzo, Rabbi, the Israelites, the ones that grew with each test, were they shedding the old man gradually? When you say 
quote unquote leaving the old man? Is it first making that decision and then making yourself at each test leave another piece of the old man? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Look, nobody's going to bury the old man, come out and just be done. I'm good. I'm new. Okay? You try, but then all of a sudden you are, uh, well, just like um, Annabelle said, right? Annabelle said that just recently I shot another one of those jars that I hadn't hit before and she hadn't realized was a problem until she actually learned something new that she hadn't learned before, right? So you, you're going to learn new information and then realize there's things that need to be fixed. Also, you ready for this? The more you're honest with yourself, the more you'll start to see things in yourself that you blocked, that you didn't want to see, okay? Like when I've had to do counselings with husbands and wives or just individuals, I say, look, I'm sorry, but you're the problem here. Oh, no, this pro No, you're handling this wrong you're, because you're not understanding. You're overreacting this, this, and this because they would not see themselves that way because most people are used to everything being an outside problem. Do you understand that when Israel left Egypt, if they arrived in the land, actually it didn't make any difference really, but if they had arrived in the land immediately, they would have still been the slaves of Egypt now in the land. Now, 40 years later, more of them had improved, so they actually did okay for a little while and at different times because they weren't all as bad as they were when they first left Egypt, okay? But all of you that leave a congregation, you go, blah, 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 and you go to another one, how many congregations have you left? And every time, who do you bring with you? You. But you want to point the finger at every congregation, but sometimes it's you, or every relationship that goes bad, then sometimes it's you, at least part of it. But you don't want to see your con you know, contribution to all that. That's a big part of this. So yes, you're going, to you're going to lose parts of that old man gradually. Two different ways. One, I'm going to say something from the mic, and you're going to go, oh, wait a minute, maybe that's me. Maybe I need to fix that, right? Or two, it's going to be something you've heard before but never thought it was you until you got to the place where you could be honest enough with yourself and then see it. Yeah. Okay? Or the unfortunate luck or fortune to end up in my counseling room and have me just get in your face and say, you're not seeing this, okay? Which is Abba trying to get your attention directly because you, you came to me and then you got the straight in the face. This is, you're not seeing. You got to look at yourself and realize this is you. Look, one of the first counselings I ever did with a married couple, I had to say to the wife, I said, look, I think this is a lot of nonsense what you said. She looked at me like, what? I said, because I didn't hear one part of this that was you. What did you do? I didn't do anything. That's nonsense. What did you do? Okay? You contributed in some way. It wasn't all the other person. At least in the situation she was describing, right? You have to always ask, you know, is any of this me? Now sometimes, you know, like, 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 okay, you know like if you're in a traffic and somebody just hits you from behind and you're sitting still, well none of that was you. But a lot of other things that happen when you're driving and you might get hit or something, maybe a little of it was you because you didn't look, you this, you were going too slow, too fast, something, right? Even though somebody hit you. So that's why they call these things no fault and you always get some partial blame, whatever, right? And anything that's going on in your life, the majority of it may be really somebody else's fault, but you gotta ask, did I do anything to contribute? What can I learn about me? Maybe it's all their fault and what you learn about you is you handled it badly. Maybe you just didn't react well, do you understand? Okay? So yes, Delia, you're going to grow gradually over time. At least you're supposed to. Some of you don't because you don't get it. You're not looking at that. You're supposed to grow. That's why I say every, like every Rosh Kodesh we talk about this. You should be looking back to see where you are and seeing where you are now and seeing is there any evidence of growth. And if there is, great. If there isn't, make more effort. If there is, I, just, I said that was great, but still, make more effort. Keep growing, in other words. Don't get complacent. Look, I know hypocrisy is a big deal for unleavened bread because we talk about that's what leaven is from scripture and the get out the leaven teaching, but you know what'll kill you more than anything else is complacency. That's what wrecked me at 20 years old or 18 years old making the money I was making, you know, $150 an hour. I don't make $150 an hour any other time in my life. That was the most ridiculous amount of money I ever made, okay? And so we talk about make your age. I was making like 10 times my age almost. And yet, I was complacent. So I didn't do anything else, really. Don't get complacent. That will kill you more than anything else. Always have that hunger and thirst for righteousness, to go forward, to keep moving, to grow and grow and grow and grow. 
Okay? Amen? Amen. All right.